Hello, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to this EBRD panel on digital dividends. I'm Melinda Crane, Senior Political Analyst at Deutsche Welle, and it's a great pleasure to accompany you as moderator. Whether you're joining us online or whether you're live with us here in Zamakand, we're very glad to have you with us as we explore digital technology's impact on financial inclusion. And we do so because a digital-first business model doesn't automatically translate into inclusion. And while digital technologies do allow for novel ways of engaging with customers, for expanding services also to non-financial products, and also for simplifying processes, they also bring costs and operational risks. So our objective today, in light of the overarching theme of this year's uh, EBRD annual meeting, which is investing in resilience, is to talk about how we can maximize the benefits of digitalization while mitigating risks and uncertainty. And we've got an outstanding group of panelists to do exactly that. They represent three different regions, and all of them are, in fact, uh, at financial institutions that are pioneering the use of digital technology. It is a great pleasure to introduce Amil Sakanovich. He is chair of the management board of ProCredit uh, Bank, Sarajevo, Bosnia, and Herzegovina. And ProCredit has a strong regional presence in southeastern Europe and is focusing on becoming a house bank to uh, small scale and medium sized enterprises. Seated next to him is Spartak Tetrashvili. He is CEO of TBC Bank Uzbekistan which was launched as the first fully digital bank in the country and is a subsidiary of the Georgia-based TBC, which in fact is one of the largest banking groups in the Caucasus region. In the middle, it's a pleasure to welcome Lama Zawati. She is Chief Executive Officer and former CFO of Jordan's Microfund for Women, the largest microfinance institution in Jordan. She's also uh, previously worked in the telecoms and digital service provider Orange, great to have you with us. Next to her is seated Vladimir Vukotic. He is CEO and chairman of the executive board of Three Bank, which is based in Serbia. It's focused on financial services for the financially excluded and has become one of the most successful microfinance banks in southeastern Europe. Then we have next to him Ilya Avramov. He is chief risk officer of Khas Bank, and it is one of Mongolia's leading financial institutions. He works closely with its CEO on the bank's digitalization program. And finally, a great pleasure to welcome Francis Malige, Managing Director, Head of Financial Institutions at the EBRD, covering Eastern Europe, the Western Balkans, Turkey, and the Southern and Eastern Mediterranean region. Before we begin, dear ladies and gentlemen, just a couple of technical hints. We do have translation available in English and Russian. You see here the channels uh, on the screens and it is available on your headphones if you're with us in the room or if you're joining us online on the Interactio app. We'll also be taking your questions, dear ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the panel. You can submit them by going to slido.com and using the code 1279662. You see it on your screens right now. Please choose our session, Digital Dividends, and post your question there. If you're here in the room, there is a QR code, hopefully, on the back of your seats that you can uh, point your phone at and then submit your question. And now, let's take a quick look at how an EBRD-supported digital in innovation has helped widen access to financial services, including for rural entrepreneurs.
Dear ladies and gentlemen, for those who are clustered there at the entrance, please do uh, come in. I see at least five empty seats in the room. So if you'd like to take a seat, you're more than welcome to do so. We have quite a few empty seats here in this block and one there, I believe. So I'll just give you a chance to get settled. Those in the back, anybody want to come all the way in and sit down? No? Okay. So we just saw a really positive example there of digital tools potential for boosting inclusion. But is that potential being fully realized? We asked you, ladies and gentlemen, and our audience in general to share your perspective in the run-up to this meeting. Let's take a very quick look at your answer before we get started. We asked you whether digitalization in financial services does more to improve convenience for wealthy clients clients in developed markets, or whether it truly supports access for the underserved. And if we can get that result up on the screen, here we see it. A good two-thirds of the respondents said digitalization is boosting access for the underserved. So let's hear now how our panelists see it. I'd like to ask each of you to tell us about your organization's digitalization journey, as it were, including how it's changed the culture of the organization, and also whether and how it has, in fact, enhanced your own services to groups it, that otherwise, perhaps, wouldn't be reached by the financial sector, or whether you would say the main impact actually is improving service for existing climate groups. And if I may, I will just go straight down the panel, starting uh, here, right next to me, with Amir Sakanovic, ProCredit. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, hello to all the part participants, and just to thank uh, the organizers, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, both the event and, and the place are very inspiring. Uh, regarding uh, ProCredit Bank, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, I'll just try to keep it compact. Uh, we entered the market 25 years ago trying to support entrepreneurs in a post-war uh, informal economy. And uh, today, after 25 years, we are leading bank in small and medium enterprises, for, as a bank for small and medium enterprises. And our digitalization journey started some 10 years ago with a shy uh, attempt or introduction of online, online payments. And uh, I would say then we int int intensified it, and by 2016, we actually not only switched uh, for, to the online payments, we also contracted our network, or in a way we killed our network, as we did not use it anymore. We just stayed in a six large cities from 45 locations that we had, that we had before, and we learned how to manage the documentation. Uh, why, why we did it? We saw in the long term that actually uh, having internet, being online, Actually, we can, we can access our clients anywhere, but at the same time, of course, by keeping, peop keeping people who's gonna, who, who, will, who would work on a relationship. And uh, this was a large internal transformation, both internally and toward the clients. And uh, was it an easy job? Obviously not. There was a lot of friction both inside and convincing the clients, of course, to, to switch uh, in, a short, in a short period of time. But uh, was it rewarding? Uh, definitely it was. First of all, internally, it did not change the culture. It did not change, change in principle who we are, uh, but it changed uh, what we thought is possible. So people who, when we, when we climb the mountain, I mean, the hills behind are easier, easier to walk over. And uh, that is one aspect. And second, more important aspect, it helped us to focus on the clients, on the, on the, on the core business, and, uh, and where we want to be excellent. And uh, if we come to the question of, of the access uh, uh, to finance, in our case, after this transformation was done, we have been growing 10% a year, and today we have 20, 25% share in all of the companies, or 30% export-oriented companies. But I'm trying to say we accessed the regions, remote regions, border regions, and undeveloped regions, which was our aim. Very interesting. Thank you very much. And you briefly mentioned challenges. We will come back to those uh, in a second round of discussion. But first, let me go to TBC's uh, Mr. Tetroshvili, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us here. And uh, briefly, I will describe the TBC Bank Uzbekistan and our path. Basically, we didn't make any transformation of the company because we were burned as a digital company, as a digital bank. So we initially started to build our processes fully end to end digitally and we're proud to have really 100% digital processes. There are no human interaction whatsoever process that we have in a bank. And uh, 
Of course, we have some physical presence in the country in order to show our brand. Uh, otherwise, it's a bit difficult when you are the newcomer on the market to get the trust of the population. And at the same time, the digital way of banking people is something new and was something new for, for Uzbekistan. And we did some kind of um, uh, touch with, with our clientele. But the presence that we have there is not for the transactional purposes, but it's purely consultational purposes. If client comes to our showroom, we don't call them the branches, they can get just a consultancy. They cannot get any kind of service or transactions. They cannot do any kind of transaction in our showrooms. As of inclusivity, of course, it helps a lot when we are serving our clients digitally. And we are, I, I would say, even killing several pains that helps inclusivity a lot. First is the distance, because obviously the banks cannot have the branches everywhere, right? And if you want to serve the entire population, and the country is huge, mm -hmm. and it has a lot of regions, right? They need huge infrastructure to reach each and every client. In the case of the digital banking, the only thing you need is the uh, internet coverage and the smartphone device in order to be able to uh, download the application. And second, I think the very important painkiller is the privacy issue. Uh, because mentally, there are many people who think that, okay, if I will go to the bank, what others will think, they will see me. Mm -hmm. Of course, the banking secrecy is the main principle of the banking in general. But still, when you are banking people like standard way, you cannot really do the 100% privacy because everybody can see if you are entering the branch, if you are op or like approaching it, right? In case of the digital service, nobody sees what you are doing with your smartphone, right? So this, is, this gives a even much more convenience and you are even more brave to make this first step. The only challenge we still face, and uh, I think it's not unique for Uzbekistan only, this is the financial literacy and education of the, of the population. Mm -hmm. Let's come back to that one. Thank you Thank very you. much for that. Madame Zawati, microfinance, uh, tell us uh, your experience. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to participate in this panel. Actually, for Microfund for Women, it's the first and the largest uh, non-for-profit organization, microfinance institutions in Jordan. We, it's it was launched in 1996, and MFW is dedicated to empowering entrepreneurs, and uh, especially we focus in particular for women. Uh, most of the products and uh, services designed to empowering and serving uh, and to upgrade their projects and businesses. Uh, we need to give them more uh, opportunities to upgrade their businesses and uh, to build up their competences so they can uh, grow their businesses. For Microfund for Women, uh, we focus in rural area and urban areas, and we notice that they have uh, a huge gap in using technology, especially for women. And uh, we notice that it's our responsibility to give them more uh, focus uh, and provide them more opportunity to use the new services and new technology. Uh, according to MFW strategic <coughs> approach, and we need to focus uh, how to uh, link our customers and beneficiaries to be uh, familiar with using uh, wallets, uh, uh, friendly interfaces, uh, uh, platforms, and we build for them a mobile application, and uh, we switch and convert our lending processes to be via wallets, and also we help them to have uh, uh, linkages and uh, networking with our uh, uh, with other beneficiaries so they can uh, help them to have e-commerce channels to sell their products and also uh, self-confidence how to use and to be separated and fully independent when mm -hmm. they use uh, their wallets and their money when they cash out no one they can ask them uh, yeah. where to go where to spend their monies they have fully independent wallets and uh, the main objectives for MFW actually in the, the online training and to build their financial literacy and an e-learning program which we encourage all beneficiaries to have at least three online program uh, during the term of their loans and according to these topics 
they can increase their competences and their knowledge around, uh, according to financial literacy, uh, how to use technology, how to link their businesses to others, and to benefit from all services and uh, financial and non-financial non services that MFW presented to our beneficiaries. Thank you very much. And that uh, aspect of autonomy, of course, linking up closely with the privacy aspect uh, that Mr. Mr. Tetrashvili mentioned. Let me go over to uh, three banks, uh, Mr. Vukotic, and ask you to talk about your digitalization journey. Yeah, thank you for uh, offering uh, me this opportunity to talk about our journey. First few sentences just about our startup and ownership, which uh, enable us to be quite different bank than most banks even here. So we were started in an apartment in 2002, a startup bank, you know, with one million investment from USAID, uh, basically without any headquarters, so basically enabled us, the team, to make everything different. And many things that I will say today will not be easy to be applied in other banks. Uh, for us, today we are a bank that has 51% market share in Serbia in agro lending and 33% entrepreneurial lending, so we are quite significant in some of the areas in lending. Uh, for us, technology was always an accelerator, not momentum creator. It's easy to say and it kind of seems logical, but we don't see many of the companies and banks using that is this way, in this way. Why do I say this? We had a customer process for agro lending, which took two, about two to three days to approve loans. Then we drawn in 2013 the customer process on the sheet of paper and started to, to think how to improve this process by sending SMSs to the head office with the customer GMB number and so on and so on. Just in one year down the road, we had a tablet approval which was approving loans in half an hour. So digitalization doesn't mean to be only the end banking for clients. It can be the digitalization of internal processes. Yeah. So we were probably one of the first banks to have a customer approval for 2,000 loans on the field within half an hour. Uh, Later on, we went in the customer interface, and I can say one of the setbacks, although as, as a small bank and bank that always ask, why do we do something? Not just let's buy what others are buying. Uh, we started to do, we were one of the first, fourth, first banks in Serbia to have a, a digital loan. Uh, and this is a setback for us, why? We went for the first digital loan in Serbia, which was one-time password, so no, no uh, signing of documents, no nothing. You're signing with a one SMS. Uh, what we got there? We got uh, online gamblers, we got bad clients, we got everybody because only them, they wanted to take a loan first time from a bank, at least in our region, through digital. And they also like privacy, of course. <laughs> yeah, so basically we learned that at least in our region, the digital must, the last thing to digitize is a l first loan approval. At, at least in our region. Mm -hmm. Maybe in Asia it's different, but for us. So what we then learned is let's do digital everything, which means loan renewals, potentially deposits, potential payments. We are not doing that yet. But then no, only then you are doing the first loan approval. That, that was our setback, you know, in the last two years. Uh, all in all about the culture, because we are so much uh, focused on financial inclusion, I think it's only enabled our culture even more. Technology enabled us to do mm -hmm. processes more efficiently. Why? Because uh, we, we call it call it physical digital. So it must be physical presence plus digital. So physical presence can be half an hour, can be 15 minutes, but they must physically see the face because they are not our rural clients. 75% of our clientele is not digitally literate very much. Mm -hmm. So we need to teach them something before they they start trusting us. Thank you very much. Let me go over now to Ilya uh, Avramov, uh, Chief Risk Officer, as I said, at Kharsbank, and uh, tell us about your own uh, journey and lessons learned. Thank you, first of all, for inviting Kharsbank uh, to this forum and uh, to this very exciting discussion and panel. Kharsbank's uh, story has started 20 years ago uh, when it was founded on the principles of providing financial equal access to financial services to everyone. It started, it, its roots are uh, with microfinance. So from the first day on, uh, the motto of the bank was 
provide equal financial services also to the underserved. So up to this day, we continue to comply with those founding principles and provide financial services to all in Mongolia. Uh, a little bit about Mongolia. Mongolia is a vast country, so the land size of the country is uh, three times the size of France, for example. But the population of Mongolia is just uh, over three million people, uh, whereby half of those uh, are living in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. So that is the market that we are operating in. And uh, the digitalization in that type of market has been essential. Uh, our uh, first, like the start of digitalization, uh, is back in 2008 when, for the first time, the customer started using SMS messaging to, <laughs> to, to uh, be banked uh, through uh, digital channel. And since then, of course, the rapid introduction and penetration of uh, mobile, b mobile phone banking services, and especially smartphones in Mongolia, has uh, dramatically changed the situation. And nowadays, uh, more than 97%, for example, of our services we provide through the digital channel. Thank you very much. And Francis, you've heard a wide range of comments, uh, clearly all of them indicating that, in fact, digital does enhance inclusion. Your thoughts? First of all, uh, I'm impressed with these clients, uh, and I'm impressed with all of them. Uh, what I take from this is, first of all, that uh, it's all driven by the client needs. Uh, digitalization is, is a way to, uh, to answer the needs of the client, be they uh, you know, nomadic uh, uh, farmers in, uh, in Mongolia or be they female entrepreneurs in, in Jordan and so on. But the, the way I, I see it as well is uh, increasingly banks go through a digitalization journey out of competitiveness reasons. Uh, and it's very important to me, uh, as IBRD, we're, we're a transition bank, so our job is to make ourselves ir irrelevant in the long term because our clients and the countries where we invest have reached the level of development of advanced market economies. And what uh, in digitalization plays both ways. It's, uh, uh, I see a lot of investment in digital services that goes to the large wealthy markets. And therefore, the solutions, the tools available to the individuals and to the SMEs in those markets are more advanced than the ones that are available in our markets if we don't do anything about it. And therefore, the gap between those advanced countries and our countries of investment only grows. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have decided to make that digitalization a, a strategic priority for IBRD because we don't want that gap to grow. We exist to reduce that gap. And we see that g digitalization is a great tool because it reduces the cost to serve. And uh, uh, in many of these countries, the revenue available per client is relatively small. So if you have a cost base of Germany and you try to do banking in Jordan, it's not going to work very well. So uh, mm -hmm. with digitalization, you can have a lower cost. Uh, you can help your clients achieve a lower cost. We have products where we uh, actually help banks digitalize their own clients in some <laughs> of our countries of operations. Uh, and so both at the level of the countries at the level of the institutions on stage here and at the level of their clients, digitalization is a very important journey. Thank you very much. So you've all made a really compelling case for the fact that there are big dividends from going digital. Let me nonetheless ask you to talk about a few of the challenges, some that you have mentioned, others uh, that, that you haven't, and also briefly, if you would, please, so we can be sure to get to audience questions a little bit later. But if I might, if I might start with a question to you, Mr. Sokanovich, uh, progress in financial inclusion has in fact been broad, but it is often also somewhat shallow more than a billion formerly unbanked uh, people now have acquired access to a formal bank account, but there hasn't been a similar rise in access to credit, for example, or to savings and insurance products. Why do you think mm -hmm. that is, and what are, uh, what are people in the sector doing to address that? Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, as you rightfully I implied in the, in, the, in the question itself, uh, the channel, the account, is obviously not uh, sufficient 
uh, for a wider population or for companies to bank, uh, either in terms of saving to deposit money with us or, or for us to be able to provide credit. And uh, I mean, to touch on savings, savings is obviously, at least in our, in our experience, and I believe that is experience of, of others as well, uh, savings is a factor of, first of all, it's formal income that whether private individuals uh, actually do receive their salaries through the account, that companies do officially do their business through the account. Uh, it's, a, it's a question of, of potential to save, of culture of saving. Uh, and it's also the question of, of the trust in the banking system, depending again on the tradition and uh, long-term stability which, which, which it brings. Uh, credit, on the other hand, it's, it's even more complex. I mean, in order to provide credit to uh, entrepreneurs, to companies, uh, we, need, we need a lot of data and we need relevant data, and uh, whether in form of, of uh, financial reports, uh, history, etc. And uh, if we do not have that, what, what happens? We do, not, we do not do banking, and we do those, those guys do it themselves. Uh, 25 years ago, again, in, in, in Bosnia, informal market, post-war, no information. What we had to do, we had to build credit technology of our own. Actually, we had to go out, meet entrepreneurs, do those balance sheets ourselves, and, and P&L cash flows, and, and find out a few things about them, but what's, what's their history. So uh, we had to do that, and we, uh, today, some of these companies that we find as entrepreneurs are today leaders in the field, in, they, in their respective industries. But the uh, first step we had, to, we had to make. And is that sustainable in a long, in a long, uh, long term? No, it's not, but it helps uh, development and transition. And today it's a different picture. Today we have, we have most of the reports, most of them are formal, not up, the, up to the level that we, uh, that we want, but uh, those are generally up the obstacles uh, in terms of uh, the question. Very interesting, thank you. So availability of data, I'd be very interested if others also wish to speak to that. But let me jump over, I'm going to uh -huh. mix up the order a little bit. Let me jump over to Madame Zawati, if I may, and talk about another gap because, as you mentioned, there has been substantial improvement in women's access to financial services, yet the fact is they do still continue to lag behind men to quite a significant degree, according to the IMF, uh, and that is true in many countries countries, whether it's digital or traditional services that you look at. So what are the barriers that are standing in the way? Okay, first of all, as you know, because we are serving more than 140,000 active borrowers and 96 uh, percentage of them uh, women are women, uh, we believe that the persistent gender gap in access to financial services, including both, both the digital and traditional uh, services can be attributed to several barriers that women face uh, during uh, her businesses and home-based businesses. These barriers contribute to the lag in women's access compared to men in Jordan and on the MENA also. Uh, I believe that there is the main factors that affect uh, women, hinder women's access to financial services. One, the first one, and it uh, has a very and a huge percentage, uh, social cultural norms and discriminations. All practices can restrict women's uh, access to financial services. Uh, gender rules, advices, and uh, expectations may limit their decision making also, uh, and they uh, become lack of power. A lack of control over financial services. Mm -hmm. uh, the second point in limited financial literacy and awareness, uh, it's not fair for all women in uh, Jordan. They have limited access and equal opportunities to give more awareness sessions and educations for financial literacy. It's not available for anyone uh, and most of them they have to pay and it's not available even for free. Uh, unequal economy, economic situations and opportunities, uh, like wages, low income, they focus on men, uh, big opportunities for women, not for women. Uh, they uh, not encourage women to have uh, fully independent businesses and the start a business. Uh, also, uh, financial instability makes it difficult to meet eligibility even for credit, to invest, to have uh, her own business, even mm -hmm. to have collateral to help her to find the credit line with local banks. And the uh, final one, <coughs> lack of digital uh, uh, 
uh, infrastructures like uh, lack of uh, internet access, like mm -hmm. uh, lack of internet access, uh, also lack of uh, using smartphones in their areas. It's not uh, available for anyone. It's too expensive for them to use it. And I think we have to work as a group with the CBJ of Jordan to find the solutions and to upgrade our uh, processes, regulations, to help women to mm -hmm. be fully independent and has uh, her yeah. own businesses. Thank you. So broader structural and societal uh, obstacles uh, there. Let me jump again over to Mr. Uh, Avramov. And uh, you and several others mentioned the complexity of uh, the, the rural situation, the fact that uh, many uh, of the countries that you're working in have a lot of territory and, uh, and smaller populations. Now, you are at Schatzbank putting a focus on green loans and also on outreach to rural entrepreneurs, as I understand it. What are your lessons learned uh, that you can share, perhaps, in the challenges that you've faced and how digital technology can uh, address them? Um. Well, as I mentioned, digitalization uh, has helped a lot in reaching our customers in remote rural areas. And uh, it has been essential for us. However, you cannot only uh, rely on digital channel to reach those customers. So what we are applying uh, is a hybrid solution whereby, as mentioned by the other panelists, the tablet banking is essential. So a uh, combination of digital and tablet banking, as we call it, uh, helps us in reaching the customers in rural areas. And, and what about those digital literacy issues that several people have mentioned? Is that an obstacle in dealing with rural entrepreneurs? Oh, well, uh, I don't think in the case of Mongolia that uh, digital literacy is the main obstacle. Customers have quickly adopted the mm -hmm. technology and are using it uh, actively. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let's stay with the rural dimension, and I'll come back, if I may, to TBC's uh, Mr. Tetroshvili. And I know that you also, in your expansion into Uzbekistan, are focusing on rural areas and also on expanding your offerings to include micro-businesses and women. Um, so again, what challenges have you encountered in doing that? Um, first of all, I have to probably explain what does it mean when we are expanding to rural areas? Because as I said, if you have an internet and smartphone, you can be banked with us. But when we are saying we are expanding, we mean exactly the overcoming the challenges we are, that we are facing. So as I mentioned, there are two types of literacy issue. First is the financial, and the second one is digital literacy, right? Uh, because yeah. you know the population that can be banked, even more in the rural areas, they are kind of older generation. And even if they're pretty much literate in terms of the financial understanding, they might, might be not literate in, in the digital world, right? And when we are expanding, it means we are appearing there physically to make more consultancy to them how to use the application. This is the only thing we do. And second thing is the, the way how we communicate with our clientele. Obviously, we are the digital bank and our main source of communication are the social networks. And those people are less exposed to the social networks. So based on the statistic in, in Uzbekistan, actively over around 6 million people are using social networks. The rest are basically more focused on offline marketing, so to say. And we are now more and more going into the offline communication, offline marketing communication that enables us to reach even more and more rural areas, which is, again, very much important in terms of Uzbekistan because Urbanization level is very low. Only 51% of the population lives in bigger cities and another 49, so the half of the population is in the rural areas and we want to reach them. And uh, as you already mentioned, so reaching those rural areas, we are increasing the financial inclusiveness of the country, definitely. And we are reaching their women that are mainly busy with this, this household things and having their own small businesses there. And we had a nice video in the beginning of our session that was exactly our client oh yeah. who happened to take the, the loan. And when we asked for use of proceeds, because on those loans that we are providing now, there are no concrete use of proceeds. They can use it for anything. 
And it happened to be that this lady bought a cow and she wanted to increase uh, his cattle and, and uh, his so-called agribusiness. So we, when we are analyzing the use of proceeds of our loans, although they, we call them the retail loans, we see that around 20% of those loans are used for small household businesses that they're having in, in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. And again, if I will be using uh, statistics, the women are better clients for the loans than the men. They pay better than, than, than the men, men still do. So maybe we can say that you're more responsible. So it's, <laughs> it's very nice. <laughs> <thing. laughs> exactly. exactly. I don't think you're the only one who's made that experience. I've heard that <laughs> elsewhere as well. Gender <laughs> inequality is an issue. <laughs> let, me, let me go over to uh, Mr. Vukotic, if I may, and talk about another uh, cluster of challenges, namely cybersecurity risks. And clearly they influence the very foundation of the customer-bank relationship, which is trust. How do you find the right balance between maximizing digital opportunities, but also minimizing risks and maintaining trust? Thank you. We are, we are probably not the best bank to talk about cybersecurity uh, because you'll hear why and I will say some mind-provoking things connected to this. First of all, we had the privilege to use our business model in preventing cybersecurity. How, how that's so? We never tried to be a universal bank. So, if we want to do lending, we do only lending who is in cybersecurity knows that loan is not really a good, good thing to be attacked. Because loan process, you know, if you even attacked it, corrupted, you'll not get the money mm -hmm. out. Uh, the ne so if you buy M banking from the shelf, like other banks are buying, then it includes all the whistle uh, bells and whistles, and it can be attacked. But if we stick to our business model, which is lending and deposits, <coughs> then it's much less uh, you know, potential to be attacked. What we do with deposits, that will be the next chapter in our net banking. I'm not mentioning payments uh, intentionally. With deposits, you know, we collect deposits, but deposits can go only back to the account it came from. So the other bank needs to worry about cybersecurity, <laughs> you know. Because why? We, we are not a bank that wants to be universal. We don't want to open a current account. We don't want to give you a card. We do what we are good at, which is take deposits and lend to the financial excluded. And this is hard to be applied to universal banks. And it's very hard to go back from universal bank model. So, <laughs> you know, so, you know, that's how we basically, our business model is basically protecting us from the cybersecurity risks. Mm -hmm. Although we have to have cybersecurity yeah. checks for sure. And that's my mind-provoking thing. Well, why every bank wants to be the same like all the other banks? You know, one, one example. 12 years ago, my board was always pushing me, fee income, fee income, fee income. Never really accepted this. I was always delaying, delaying, and finally they stopped. <laughs> now we had 99% <laughs> of interest income, 1% of fee income. Because fintech will much harder attack my interest income than my fee income. Fintech can erase your payment business, but can hardly erase in the Eastern European and European mm -hmm. environment your lending business. Why? Because central bank will not allow them to hold deposits. So this is my provoking. <laughs> very, very interesting. And that takes us into another topic that I would like to pick up on in a moment. But let me just stop here and ask Francis, uh, any comments on what we've just heard about the challenges, Francis? Well, I, I think uh, uh, digital brings its own challenges, but... Uh, Ultimately, uh, banking, in the way Vladimir defines it, is actually about uh, taking someone's money and lending it to someone else. And by doing that, actually taking the risk of that person. And that, that is the subtlety in banking, is to, uh, unlike many other businesses where you do a transaction, you sell a pair of shoes, you get the cash, and that's it. You don't have to worry about what the guy does with the pair of shoes. Right? But in banking, you do. Because, in fact, you give them money and you have to hope that, or to expect that within the next six months to 20 years, they're going to pay you back. So it it requires a fundamental judgment on the, on the person. So I'm glad that we have a credit officer actually on the, uh, <laughs> on the panel because it's fundamentally about, uh, about risk and about risk appetite. Now, okay. uh, and that's why, by the way, when we do inclusion products, we include often first loss covers because we want to encourage our banks to take more risk, right? To, for the same risk appetite to go a bit further, a, a bit more. 
And I think digital plays the same role. You have more data, essentially, if you do digital well about your clients. You know your clients much better. We have clients that uh, decide to, to land on the basis of spending patterns of a digital wallet. Because you know the spending pattern, you know if the person seems reasonable or seems like uh, they're going to blow their paycheck on uh, you know, gambling and, uh, and drinking, and that's not the same you know, repayment behavior. Mm -hmm. So you have that, you have banks that say, okay, I understand the flows of my SME clients much better. On that basis, I'm going to make a credit decision. When their clients themselves are digital, you have also vastly more information. You have a farmer, if you have a farmer that has a digital report about the state of their crops every night, because they have an army of drones flying over their fields. Obviously, this is not microfinance anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but uh, then you, uh, you, can, you can decide uh, to, uh, to, uh, to lend to them if they share that information with you. So there's lots of mm -hmm. issues on privacy as well that the clients need to agree to share that, uh, that information. Mm -hmm. And finally, one challenge that uh, um, uh, I'd like to highlight is, uh, is also how digital pro progresses and how you can get banks to do things which banks should never do, which is to do things that they do not fully understand. When you use artificial intelligence, after mm -hmm. a while, you don't understand why you're making decisions because it's the artificial intelligence that does the decision for you. And there's no way to audit the reasons uh, why uh, the robot has made the decision. And so what you end up doing is actually reinforcing biases because an algorithm is just as good as the biases of the people that write it. Mm -hmm. okay. But uh, at the same time, you also uh, end up probably uh, sometimes making loans to the wrong people. And so to me, these are the, the, the core challenges, but, uh, uh, but I think risk, and the, the, I, I fully agree with you, Vladimir, that uh, the payments business, the fee business is easy to, to take away, mm -hmm. but the really difficult thing to do in banking is this fundamental judgment on your client's <coughs> ability to repay. And for that, I think FinTech has a way to go. Ah, yes. Thank you, thank you very much. So let's pick up on just a couple of aspects uh, at, with super short uh, answers, if you would, uh, so that we can come to audience questions shortly. And I'd like to talk about trust, <coughs> risk, and the competitive landscape going forward. And if I can come back to Prokredit and Mr. Sokanovich, mm -hmm. you have given up your branch network, you've mm -hmm. gone fully digital, and has that affected your customer relations dur d through mm -hmm. the loss of those trust relationships mm -hmm. in analog? Well, uh, just uh, maybe to rephrase a little bit, yes, we have gone fully digital on the transaction and communication. However, we kept uh, a relationship and we kept actually people who are in charge of <laughs> establishing a relationship, analyzing and making decisions. To what uh, Fra Francis has, has mentioned, it is very uh, difficult uh, 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 to assess who can repay the loans and whether the future that the, the entrepreneurs envision uh, is, is possible, whether, whether, whether the, the vision they have uh, is, is really going to play out. So it's fine now, we have, the, uh, we have the data, we import the data, we analyze the past, but uh, it's not the whole story. We want uh, our uh, business client advisors uh, to analyze business furthermore, and that means that they need to analyze uh, uh, management capacity, that they need to analyze uh, the business model, that they need to analyze the industry, and they need to analyze uh, the projection or the or the future that the, the 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 manager and the owners sees, and that is why we, besides having investment in technology, I must say we we remain uh, and we stay with the investment in people exactly for these skills, which uh, uh, which then allow us to really build trust relationship and to grow together with uh, with, with with entrepreneurs and small medium enterprises. Hope I have answered. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. And then let me um, ask, and I, I'll, I'll start with Mr. Avramov on this one, but anybody else who wants to weigh in, just give me a sign as well. Do you see the main competition in future coming more from new digital banks or possibly also fintechs, non-banks that are looking to uh, provide those uh, fee services that were mentioned already? or from traditional financial providers who are bringing digital markets, perhaps uh, digital products to market more quickly? Well, what we see in Mongolia is that the banks are providing basically the same suite of uh, digital offerings to the customers uh, with minor, minor differences, but essentially, essentially each bank provides the full suite of, of digital offerings to, to their customers. Uh, NBFIs uh, have been growing very fast. Uh, they have been growing faster than the banks, although their market share is still 
around 5%, which is not that much on one hand. On the other hand, due to the uh, different regulation of the NBFIs, meaning that they are more loosely regulated than the banks, uh, yeah. they have been at the forefront of the, <laughs> of the digital innovation. And they have been actually able for that same reason to be at that spot. So yes, I see, I see them as, as up and coming. Uh, uh, challenger. Also, uh, we see uh, another uh, source of competition from the digital and also physical merchants who are recently, who have recently started to offer uh, products like uh, buy now, pay later. That has become quickly and very popular. Thank you very much. And perhaps also a word on fintechs uh, from you, Madame Zawati, if you would, uh, because you did mention that you uh, did work with them. What are the risks and what are the rewards? Hello, first of all, we need to think, you know, what's valuable for uh, the organization and uh, if it's valuable also for our clients, beneficiaries and uh, for sure collaboration with the fintech and the third party it will be a benefits for the company uh, in main three topics in the first one i think in access to expertise we can uh, benefit from their expertise and we can create a new uh, ideas and innovations for a new products digital products and services it will help our the beneficiaries the second point uh, customized solutions uh, to design uh, customized products for microfinance beneficiaries, which uh, is totally different than local banks. And also agility and control, and when you have agile and lab, and you can test all the new products and services and systems with collaboration with a FinTech company, it will be benefit, and there is a big value added for uh, microfinance institutions. Uh, we have one point uh, related to risk mitigate and uh, we have to make sure in uh, our uh, beneficiaries data and information and our systems keep secure and that's it. Thank you very much. And I've just cast uh, a glance at the uh, audience questions, got some great questions uh, here from the audience. So I'm just going to start throwing those uh, into our discussion as well. Uh, the first one concerns um, how you work with clients directly on their own digital journeys. Uh, the questioner has phrased it like this. What about your clients themselves? Do you care how digital they are? Anybody? Mm. I see Mr. Sokanovich uh, nodding. Well, I, I guess I can because, again, we work primarily with the companies and whom we want to uh, see getting competitive, uh, both regionally and Working in Bosnia, we are on the border with, with the EU, so to say. So if they want to be competitive, they, be com they need to be competitive in the EU as well. And uh, the, the evolution, they, they, they have come to the po point where uh, digitalization of their business is of ultimate importance, exactly in order to standardize their service and, and also to be able to manage a shortage of the labor force, which I think many market experience, including, including us. So uh, we do advise, th they are aware and they go for the investments in, in digital. Uh, we advise them as well, but what helps is also if there is some cert sort of incentive, etc. cetera. And uh, f for that purpose, uh, we are also, or we are using uh, the credit line that TBRD has launched in, 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 in Bosnia, Go Digital, exactly for this purpose, uh, for combination of um, uh, dig digitalization of the, of the business and producing clean energy, green energy for own purpose as well. So uh, this incentive helps for those who uh, to, to need to make a step in order to, to invest. Thank you. I think uh, Madame Zawati and then Mr. Vukotic. Yes, go ahead. It's on, it's on. Uh, for sure, building trust with our beneficiaries, it's a key for MFW and also we can benefit uh, as uh, my colleague mentioned, in uh, dealing with EBRD, help us to uh, digitize the green energy products when we give them uh, incentive cash back and uh, we encourage them to start building their uh, new product by using the green uh, services. And also, uh, trust is a key for our beneficiaries. When they start using their wallets and see the transactions and we monitor their journey 
how to use their wallets and where they spend their money. It helped us also to uh, upgrade our uh, scoring system because we can uh, definition our clients who is uh, loyal and put them under specific programs so they can benefit from other mm -hmm. non-financial services. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Vukatic. You wanted to? Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to mention one example and, and building what on what Francis said uh, about knowing our clients. So uh, in Serbia it happened and it will happen probably in many countries that uh, Ministry of Agriculture just uh, uh, introduced the so-called digital platform to register. So one month 400,000 had to register, you know, of farmers. They had no clue how to register. We immediately sent our client advisor loan officers on the field and all our clients had a, uh, our help in registering on the e-platform. Uh, so basically we invested into the future, in the efficiency, not revenue stream, because that way we kind of help clients register, got their digital footprint, and that the future will be able to, to follow their behavior. Mm -hmm. So we used basically a statewide initiative to quickly react and, 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 and help our client and then learn them. So you know, I think banks need to be quickly to react on, on something, because if you just throw them digital on them, they would not do, but because they had to register in order to get subsidies, they went and registered, all, everybody. Mm -hmm. They were incentivized. Um, yeah. I'll go over to Mr. Tetrashvili, and you are welcome to comment on th these I other will. questions as well, but I also have one about uh, that's directly to you, and it's this. When we talk about 100% privacy of digital banking, are you using cloud services, and what pro issues does that raise in regard to cybersecurity? Thank you for the question. I think this is the most important question for the digital world, I would say, because um, we are often, me and my head of physical security are fighting about uh, very ridiculous things. Our head of security wants to put a lot of cameras in our office. He wants to put a lot of buttons to call the uh, special of the, uh, police in case of whatever happens. And I say, hey, uh, <laughs> Mr. Aziz, look around. Do you see the shop in front of our office? I think for them it's m even more riskier that they will get robbed because they have something there. <laughs> in our office, there is nothing to take. So don't worry about physical security. Mm -hmm. If they want to take our chairs and, and the tables, let them do it. So don't worry. So all in all, we have three security employees, physical security employees in a bank. But... As for the cybersecurity, this is the main uh, focus of ours. So we have, uh, we are working with the, like the, the, the most modern uh, infosec solutions. But there is a quite a big issue. Um, it's not only uh, the case of the Uzbekistan, but many other countries that are restricting to use the cloud services. And when we are not able to use f and fully utilize the cloud service solutions, then we are a bit behind of the market, meaning that, that worldwide there are a lot of new solutions appearing and majority of them are based on the cloud. And when you, you cannot utilize it fully, of course you are more exposed to the cyber uh, security issues. But nevertheless, I think that TBC Uzbekistan is doing very well with, with, the, with the cyber uh, um, sec security points that we have never had so far any kind of leakage of the information of any kind of successful attacks on our databases. Now as of the digital clients I want to comment there as well how much do we care uh, about our clients whether they are digital or not. Of course we should care because the more digital they are the more we see and know about them because the, the journey they have with us is super simple. They do not need anything but their smartphone and the face, mm -hmm. right? They just look on their smartphone, we, we make the life check that's the real person, and after giving us the permission to check their data and process it, we are able to grab a lot of information about the person. So uh, on the one hand, if they're not super digital, we can still gather a lot of information about our client, but if the, the more digital they are, the more tools they use, the more we know about them. And they have even more chance to be properly banked in terms of 
decisions that are made by our robotic systems, right? The more they know, the, the, the more uh, correct answers they, they give to their applications. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you just mentioned that are we facing or expecting uh, more competition from the classical banks or, or digital banks and the fintechs, I would say there is not proper formulation in my understanding. We shouldn't anymore use expectation in these terms because mm -hmm. the digital world is already here. We shouldn't expect anything. It's, it's, it's right here. And if somebody is still expecting and thinking that it will come, <laughs> they're pretty much behind. So because it's here and it's running in, in, in the fastest way. Thank so the, the products that are already commoditized, the simple products like, again, retail lending, micro lending, they will be fully digitized very soon in all terms. And if we are behind this track, then we lose. This is what I would like Thank to say. Thank you very much for that. And I'll go now to Francis for essentially a wrap-up comment on everything we've just uh, heard. First, uh, I'd actually like to say just a word on, on the cloud, if I may. Please. Um, uh, just very quickly, because in fact, it, it's not, it depends on how you look at the risks that you face. Right? You can say the cloud is easier to hack in, I'm not sure. Uh, you, you can say the cloud is actually good because then my data are safe for whatever is happening on the planet. And if you look at Ukraine, that had a, a no cloud policy uh, in the late days of February 2022. Yeah. Uh, cloud became available to uh, Ukrainian banks. And in fact, if you want to move to the cloud, I advise you to go to Ukrainian bank because they manage cloud migration yeah. in timings that have nothing to do with what banks do these days. Right. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, different risks that you need to, to, to take care about. And, and that's where the regulators need to take them all into account. And uh, having a bank that's entirely cloud-based, well, you know, ask the clients of Silicon Valley Bank, that's how their app disappear from their cell phones on the, uh, on the weekend when the bank closed down, only to reappear on the Monday when the bank was saved. Uh, you know, so being all on the cloud maybe is not so good. Uh, at the same time, uh, being just on the ground is not so good either. So, but. Uh, uh, I think this, uh, uh, this shows that uh, to embrace digitalization, it's a more complex world. It's a faster moving world. And, uh, you know, as banks and as bankers, we need to be agile and we need to be smarter than before. And I like the challenge. Thank you very much. Great uh, closing words there. And in fact, I'm afraid that is all that we have time for. We've heard about some very promising ways in which digital technologies are, in fact, boosting resilience by bringing financial services to populations, whether it's rural farmers, small entrepreneurs, women who wouldn't otherwise have access to them. And we've also talked about some of the challenges and the risks associated with digital first models and solutions that can mitigate those. So many, many thanks to all of you. We're going to save our applause till later, but before we close, I want to draw everybody's attention to a signing ceremony that we are going to have directly after this panel. It's closely linked to all that we've been discussing, and do join us, please, to witness the signing of a loan agreement from the EBRD uh, to the Han Bank that will promote women's entrepreneurship by assisting women-led SMEs in assessing, uh, in accessing finance, including for investments in digital businesses. And here, to close, is a short film illustrating the gains that such financing can, in fact, bring. I was exporting agriculture goods, fresh fruits, vegetables, dry fruits from Uzbekistan to all over the world. It was quite good, but I did face a few difficulties. For example, in order to find a farmer, I had to physically sit in a car, go to the regions, um, search for the farmers, talk to them. And um, at that time, I thought that there must be an easier way to find a farmer. Uh, maybe digitalization would help. Um, and that was a moment when we had the idea to build uh, the ecosystem, the platform, so farmers and exporters can find each other.
So a really great example there of how digital technologies are in fact creating new opportunities for SMEs, fostering new web networks that do bring gains for rural populations, women, and of course also ultimately for national economies. Let's now thank all of our speakers and give them a very warm round of applause. And many thanks also to you, dear ladies and gentlemen, for your attention and also for your participation through those wonderful audience questions. I do, as I said, uh, invite you to stay now for our signing ceremony. I will ask our speakers to please take your seats. We do have reserved seats for you here. And I'll ask Francis uh, to please stay with me on the stage as we welcome as we welcome Madame Erden Edelger Bavla. She is first deputy CEO of the Khan Bank, which is the largest com commercial investor in Mongolia. I'll ask both of you to take these two seats right here.